Good evening. My name is Alicia Yokoyama, and I'd like to welcome you to Lake Oswego Public Library's William Stafford Birthday Celebration. This is an event that we've held in collaboration with the Friends of William Stafford for many years, but this evening's event would not have been possible without Tom Hogan and Susan Reese, who are also tonight's hosts. Thank you both so very much. Now let me introduce Tom. Tom Hogan's latest book, Giving Thanks, New and Selected Poems, was published by Dancing Moon Press in 2018. He's the author of five chapbooks and The Promise of the Trail, also by Dancing Moon Press. He coordinates the Milwaukee Poetry Series, currently in its 15th season, and lives with his wife, Jane, in Milwaukee, Oregon. Tom, take it away. Thank you very much, Alicia. And I can just remind everybody to be muted if you're not talking and we'll uh, hear the, the poet who is speaking. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here tonight. It's, it's quite an honor to host this and to host it uh, with Sue Reese. A huge thanks to Alicia and the Lake Oswego Library for all of the work that you've done on this and enabled this to happen. So we totally appreciate it. And thank you all for, for being here too, to honor Bill Stafford and to gather together really in community and read his poetry. The poem I'm gonna to read tonight is when I met my muse. I glanced at her and took my glasses off. They were still singing. They buzzed like locusts on a coffee table and then ceased. Her voice bailed forth and the sunlight bent. I felt the ceiling arch and knew the nails up there took a new grip on whatever they touched. I am your own way of looking at things, she said. When you allow me to live with you, every glance at the world around you will be a sort of salvation. And I took her hand. When I met my muse, as I was thinking about this, that, that seemed a very uh, appropriate poem to start with because Bill Stafford uh, did have a unique view and did share it with us. And that's a big reason that we're here uh, tonight celebrating his work. Let me say uh, a couple of words about how we're gonna proceed. Uh, we have four featured readers, uh, as you know, and they are gonna read, uh, Aaron Hollowell is gonna read first, and then Emmett Wheatfall, then Patty Wixon, and then Vince Wixon. Uh, Sue and I are going to alternate uh, with the uh, introductions you know, of them. We'll have an open mic then at the, uh, after the featured readers are read. And as Alicia said, if you want to read a poem in the open mic, indicate that in the chat. And so when we get to the open mic portion, uh, we will come back and we will take the people who want to read a poem from the chat. It's my honor too, to co-host this with Sue Reese. So let me introduce her and then she's going to introduce Aaron. <clears throat> Sue's been on the faculty at Portland State since 1991. She received her MFA in poetry from Pacific University in 2006 and her MA in English from PSU in 1993. And her BS in English from Lewis and Clark College in 1974. She lives in the country <laughs> with animals. She has a number of animals. And a thing to know about Sue is that she believes that wholeheartedly, that life is a gift, it is finite, and there's really a lot of very cool stuff to experience. So would you join me in welcoming my co-host tonight, Sue Reese. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's really an honor to do this. I have something I want to uh, share first, uh, the words of Tim Barnes, who is the editor of the newsletter of the Friends of William Stafford. Until not too <clears throat> long ago, I was uh, on the board of the Friends of William Stafford, and I, I uh, stepped down just because I was getting overwhelmed by my life, um, I think, suddenly teaching online, et cetera. But uh, I, I like to remind people that this is uh, in conjunction with uh, the Friends of William Stafford. And I do believe 
Paul Ann, did you start the birthday celebrations or was that someone before you? I, uh, I don't blame you. No, I <laughs> actually, I, there had been a, um, a few of them here and there. And then um, I did one at the Westland Public Library and it was packed, just overflowing. And then another one at the Heritage House and the library and both of them were overflowing. And at that point I decided, you know, there could be more of these. And then I started organizing them in earnest. Thank you. Um, our, our, until not too long ago, Oregon Poet Laureate, Paul Ann Peterson. Um, so I wanted to read some words uh, from Tim Barnes. Uh, representing the Friends. The upcoming issue of the Friends of William Stafford, a journal and newsletter for poets and poetry, will focus on the relationship between Stafford and Robert Bly, who died in November of last year at the age of 94. Also included will be an essay by Steve Paul, author of a new biography, Literary Alchemist, The Writing and Life of Evan S. Connell. Paul has begun work on a biography of Stafford and spent two weeks in the Stafford archives at Lewis and Clark this November. Anyone interested in receiving a copy of this issue of the Friends of William Stafford journal and newsletter can become a member of the Friends of William Stafford at its website, and it's really easy, williamstafford.org, or send a request in a mailing address to Tim Barnes, the editor at tim.barnes63 at gmail.com. And if you just go online and Google williamstafford.org, uh, you can figure all that stuff out, I'm pretty sure. Um, so uh, thank you to Tim. He couldn't be here, but uh, thank you to him for um, representing. Now it's my uh, great joy to introduce our first featured reader. In 2004, I decided I wanted an MFA in poetry um, because it was something I'd wanted my whole life. And all of a sudden I realized I wasn't dead. And I went up to my first days of that and ran into someone who I just really liked at first sight, you know? Um, and we, um, spent a little bit of time together. She came to Portland, we went out to lunch. Um, and then she went to a different program and went up and has become this illustrious poet in Alaska. Um, but she's still her, which is very wonderful and, and lovely. And her, her, her poetry, her pure imagery just like slays me every time. Erin Coughlin Hollowell lives at the end of the road in Alaska where she directs Story Knife, a women writers retreat, and the Kachemak Bay Writers Conference. Her poetry collections, Pause, Traveler, and Every Atom are published by Boreal Books, an imprint of Red Hen Press. Her collection, Corvus and Crater, is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry in 2023. Erin Coughlin Hollowell. Thank you, Susan. That, that was really, really lovely. Um, first of all, I wanted to just say thank you to everyone for being here. We're going to pray that my internet connection holds. Um, it is an incredible delight for me to be among so many other people who love poetry and the, especially the poetry of William Stafford. I'm going to read two of his and then three of mine, one of which is really short. Um, it's hard to pick. I I'm, I'm, can't wait to see what other people chose. Um, I'm going to start with being a person. Be a person here. Stand by the river. Invoke the owls. Invoke winter, then spring. Let any season that wants to come here make its own call. After that sound goes away, wait. A slow bubble rises through the earth and begins to include sky, stars, all space, even the outracing, expanding thought. Come back and hear that little sound again. Suddenly this dream you are having matches everyone's dream and the result is the world. If a different call came, there wouldn't be any world or you or the river 
or the owls calling. How you stand here is important. How you listen for the next thing to happen. How you breathe. Just adore that poem. Uh, and uh, this is a poem, the next one is a poem that I pay close attention to when I write my own poetry. And it's called, Notice What This Poem Is Not Doing. <laughs> the light along the hills in the morning comes down slowly, naming the trees white, then coasting the ground for stones to nominate. Notice what this poem is not doing. A house, a house, a barn, the old quarry where the river shrugs. How much of this place is yours? Notice what this poem is not doing. Every person gone has taken a stone to hold and catch the sun. The carving says, not here, but called away. Notice what this poem is not doing. The sun, the earth, the sky all wait. The crows and the red birds talk. The light along the hills has come, has found you. Notice what this poem has not done. Yay, Bill Stafford. It's hard to follow that, so I'm gonna try my best here. Um, I'm going to read one poem from my collection, Every Atom, which is about my mother's um, descent into dementia. So you'll just so you understand that reference to my mom in the poem. And every poem in the book is entitled from a snippet of leaves of grass. So when I read the title, that's Walt, not me. Hankering, gross, mystical, nude. Dear Walt, I see you around town, your scraggly white beard and ragged jacket, leaning your bicycle in front of the post office, camped out in the library, sleeping beside a pile of books. I can't begin to imagine what your life means to you, but I want to. Put a sandwich in your pocket, put soap in your shower, put a hat on your rain wrung head. Age seems to be shaking its fist at me these days. I've just started carrying that black backpack of years and damn if I can bear to put even one year down. My mother, now a ransacked house, every window broken, and what she once knew she knew is gone. At night, I think of that soft focus where faces were hung. And to be honest, Walt, I am afraid. Fear sharpens my pencil and sends me into the dark to check out every sound. I am hoping to find you there, hidden in the woods, your pale knees sunk into the leaf litter. Oh, sure, I know what you'll say, effusing your flesh in eddies, your mouth stretched open with its habitual yowl. Hallelujah for these moments churning up the mud. Hallelujah for the waysides and the women and the men with their scarred faces. Hallelujah for twigs and flesh. But what about that hornet's nest just revealed, hanging like a wad of bad news next to the path where I've walked all summer? What about this wind which begins to slice us with its shriven grimace? Maybe it's better to put a sweater on, better to gather blankets and tea, hold our lovers close while we can still remember their names. Thank you. Um, this next poem is called Choir Hive, and it's from um, my new collection, Corvus and Crater, which is coming out from Salmon Poetry in Ireland um, next year. And it's very short, Choir Hive. Against a white sky, the birch tree opens its many dark mouths. She hears its words, golden river under snow, secret honey, clapper of vein scribed marble, the bell rings each full moon, now waning, now feeding the mountain underneath. Just one more. This is a poem that uh, was published in uh, 
Alaska Quarterly Review, and it hasn't found the collection it wants to be in yet, so I just keep tagging it along. It's called Orison, and it has an epigraph. I am part or particle of God, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I spoke to darkness. I spoke to the dancing couple, two planets conjoined, whirling above mountains until they dipped behind the bench. I spoke to a blush and a brightness that kindled along the rim and then traveled. Am this, am this flesh on this bone scaffolding, am this growl, this run of consonants without reason, am this way and then that way, am this frost ridden air smoking from my lungs. Part of the day broke, part of the story broke. Part of what humanity fashioned itself as broke. Part of a blue plate dropped on the floor broke into so many pieces it could not be mended or used again, or used the way a young woman uses her hips, or used the way an older woman uses the mirror, which has become her reckoning. Particle of the future, Particles of stardust on the top of the refrigerator. I write my name in it. Particles of light, which are simultaneously waves. Particles of a particular nature, which is me, which was me. Particle of dawn, of the way each day becomes itself, each sky, a sudden parachute of light of refraction and reflection, of the bay holding fire from the sky, holding blankness like a mirror of my gain, of my loss. God, who doesn't ride a chariot. God, who doesn't explain why some live and some die. God, who says, we all die, even God. God, who speaks to me from the dark sky, or what was the dark sky that is now filled with every size of flame? Thank you guys so much. Thank you so Thank much, you, Karen. Karen. That's wonderful. And your Wi-Fi held up too. Okay. Yeah, you just yeah. sailed right through it. That was wonderful. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our next featured reader. Emmett Wheatfall lives in Portland, Oregon. And we were commenting that he's the only one of the featured readers who are actually in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> Where he writes, records, publishes, and performs poetry. Fernwood Press, an imprint of Barclay Press, has published two books of Emmett's poetry. His collection titled, As Clean as a Bone, was published in 2018 by Fernwood Press. As Clean as a Bone was a 2019 Eric Hoffer Award finalist, as well as the Da Vinci Award finalist. Our Scarlet Blue Wounds is his latest collection and was published in November 19, 2019. We've been on the Milwaukee Poetry Series together and it's my pleasure to introduce our next featured reader, Emmett Wheatfall. Emmett? Yes, good evening, everyone. It is indeed um, a privilege and an honor to be able to join in uh, a celebration of Oregon's um, celebrated national um, poet, William Stafford. And um, it's just an honor to be able to share poetry. Uh, I'm going to share with you this evening four poems. Two of the poems, the first two, will be Stafford poems. And then the remaining two will be uh, my poems, and they're fairly short poems. So um, here we go. Uh, the first poem by Stafford is called Poetry. Poetry. Who better <laughs> to title a poem, Poetry, than our illustrious William Stafford? You can find it in his seminal work, Ask Me, 100 Essential Poems. And the poem reads as follows. <clears throat> Its door opens near, its shrine by the road. It's a flower in the parking lot of the Pentagon. It says, 
Look around. Listen. Feel the air. It interprets international telephone lines with a tune. When traffic lines jam, it gets out and dances on the bridge. If great people get distracted by fame, they forget this essential kind of breathing and they die inside their gold shell. When caravans cross deserts, it is the secret treasure hidden under the jewels. Sometimes commanders take us over and they try to impose their whole universe. How to succeed by daily calculation. I can't eat that bread, says Bill Stafford. Second poem of, of William Stafford. It's a poem he titled Father's Voice, Father's Voice. And it's in his collection, The Darkness Around Us is Deep. Selected poems of William Stafford. And I'm quite sure many of you are familiar with that collection. Father's Voice. No need to get home early. The car can see in the dark. He wanted me to be rich the only way he could, easy with what he had. And always that was his gift, given for me ever since. Easy gift, a wind that keeps on blowing for flowers or birds. Wherever I look, world, I am your slow guest, one of the common things that move in the sun and have close, reliable friends in the earth, in the air, in the rock, says William Stafford. Just two more points this evening. Um, I've been greatly influenced by William Stafford's work. Um, early on in my um, entry into poetry, I, I read a lot of his work. And um, like many of you, I was, I was inspired by his work. And I think uh, a lot of my poetry is to some degree informed by his work. So I have two more poems to share with you this evening. And these are original poems that I wrote. This poem is called Dreaming in My Salvation. Dreaming is my salvation. Floating on pool water, am I dreaming? From a feathery pillow floats a feather. Why should I care? This butterfly on my nose feels at home. I reach for the stars. They are beyond reach. I see a quarter moon. Dreaming is my salvation. In the worst of times, should I consider it shameful if I don't? I forgot my swimming trunks. Make sure you have your swimming trunks on when you're floating on water in a pool. <laughs> and then the last poem I have for you this evening is pretty special, uh, at least to me. Um, I started reading uh, William Stafford in about 2013, and I was so inspired by him that um, it informed me on a, just a really short poem uh, that I wrote and it's called 24 Roses, 24 Roses. And there was something in a book, I think a biography that I was reading about Stafford that he said all poets should really pay attention to, 24 Roses. William Stafford said, follow the golden thread. So 
we give ourselves to reason, weave ourselves anew, and the bloom shall come twice the dozen roses. Thank you this evening for the opportunity to join with you in celebrating the life of William Stafford, his birthday and life. Thank you. Are you going to introduce Sue, our next poet? Thank you, Emmett. Wonderful. I think you muted. I thought you were introducing Vince and Patty, and then I'm coming in to do something else. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to introduce Patty, and I was going to introduce Vince. Well, one of us should do it, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that wasn't in what I sent you, and I probably didn't read what you sent me. Sorry. <laughs> Well, it's my honor to introduce Patty and Vince Wixon from uh, Ashland. Patty was the first president of Friends of William Stafford. Thank you very much, Patty. And served on the board for 10 years. Patty spent several years volunteering in the William Stafford Library Archives, producing five decades of Stafford readings and interviews on 97 CDs. For 25 years, she helped organize two series in Southern Oregon of visiting writers who presented public readings and gave workshops to students and teachers. Her poems have appeared in regional and national literary journals in print and online and in six anthologies. She has four books of poetry, most recently, The Great Hunt and Other Poems, published by Cyclone Press, 2021. In 2014, Patty and her husband, Vince, received Oregon's Stuart Holbrook Literary Legacy Award. So would you join me in welcoming our next feature reader tonight, Patty Wixon. Patty. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Susan, um, both of you for inviting me to be one of the poets reading tonight. The Lake Oswego Library holds many Stafford memories for us. In the early years, the board of the Friends of William Stafford held meetings there several times. The Lake Oswego was also one of a dozens, dozens, many dozens of libraries where Nancy Winkleski and I hung part of this William Stafford broadside exhibit, How the Ink Feels. And Vince and I came to Lake Oswego Library with Dorothy Stafford many times. So thank you to Lake Oswego Library for having this Stafford celebration tonight. One thing about William Stafford's poetry is the relevancy his poems written many years ago still have to today's issues. Because of the pandemic, it's control of our lives the constant daily numbers of cases and hospitalizations. I'll begin with a poem in which Stafford deals with death and also wishing others well. From Allegiances, his book Allegiances, Bess. Ours are the streets where Bess first met her cancer. She went to work every day past the secure houses, at her job in the library, she arranged better and better flowers. And when students asked for books, her hand <clears> went <throat> out to help. <clears throat> in the last year of her life, she had to keep her friends from knowing how happy they were. She listened while they complained about food or work or the weather and the great national events danced their grotesque face important. Always pain moved where she moved. She walked ahead, it came. She hid, it found her. No one ever served another so truly. No enemy ever meant so strong a hate. 
It was almost as if there was no room left for her on, on earth. But she remembered where joy used to live. She straightened its flowers. She did not weep when she passed its houses. And when finally she pulled into a tiny corner and slipped from pain, her hand opened again and the streets opened and she wished all well. Fans of Stafford poems often like to gather poems in which he uses some of the favorite words. Rivers, sun, earth, world, brown, silence, many more. Many that you've heard in the earlier poems read this evening that you'll hear again. So I've decided to uh, choose poems that uh, use some of these words. From Smoke's Way, by the Deschutes shore. Millions of miles away at evening, the sun touches the little folded hands of the dead mouse in the grass church by the river. No tuft but gains a halo in the service, no rock unwarmed. Having no hands, the world learns everything by shouldering down in the dusk and waiting like this while the sun repeats its lesson color by color toward the brown mouse, brown paws, brown, brown grass. From the way it is in the new poem section of Sometimes I Breathe, one evening is the only poem in the way it is that was never typed up by Stafford. The editors found it in Stafford's handwritten daily writings. One evening, on a frozen pond a mile north of Liberal, almost 60 years ago, I skated wild circles while a strange pale sun went down. A scattering of dry brown reeds cluttered the ice at one end of the pond and a fitful breeze ghosted a little surface eddy of snow. No house was in sight, no tree, only the arched wide surface of the earth holding the pond and me under the sky. I would go home, confront all my years, the tangled events to come and never know more than I did that evening waving my arms in the, yellow, in the lemon colored light. I uh, mistakenly said, started to say yellow because that was what Stafford wrote originally and then he revised it to lemon colored light. I, I love that revision. Some of you who've been longtime members of the Friends of William Stafford may remember when each April for National Poetry Month, the Friends sent members a publication of a Stafford poem. In 2006, this poem was Earth Dweller, a repent, repeat, repent, okay, one more time, a reprint of an article by W.S. Merwin in the American Poetry Review titled, For an Undersea Library. He'd been asked by the book supplier of Borders to choose five books and five poems for a Trident submarine library, keeping in mind three questions. Could any poem, novel, or short story cause anyone to interrupt their learned sequence of actions once they have been ordered to launch? What words do I hope these men have read and thought of before they push buttons? How much can we believe in our own language, our literature? How far does it reach? Earth Dweller was the first poem that Merwin selected. It was all the clods at once becoming precious. It was the barn and the shed and the windmill, my hands, 
the crack Arlie made in the ax handle. Oh, let me stay here humbly, forgotten, to rejoice in it all. Let the sun casually rise and set. If I have not found the right place, teach me, for somewhere inside the clods are vaulted mansions, lines through the barn sing for the saints forever. The shed and the windmill rear so glorious the sun shudders like a gong. Now I know why people worship carry around magic emblems, wake up talking dreams they teach to their children. The world speaks. The world speaks everything to us. It is our only friend. The last one is uh, one of my own. The Earth Dweller was really an important poem to me, uh, thinking of Stafford, how <clears throat> Stafford did about how the world speaks to us about real things in nature and things created. My poem is based on a prehistoric petroglyph in Utah, The Great Hunt. We drive down steep dips in the 35 miles, and if the river's not running deep and turbulent, we can make it to the panel in Nine Mile Canyon. Its sheer vertical rock shines with brown black varnish, desert bacteria covering rocks cell by cell for thousands of years, reflecting sun moving up cliffs of crumbling petrified dunes, slabs of red rock and white rimmed sandstones piled like mounds of grain snow. The hunt shows a late season mating, a late fall mating season, a gathering of rams and ewes and lambs, each carefully chiseled to tell the story in sharp edged shapes. Mm. The sheep all face north from where winter will come. Tan figures hold bows, arrows poised to fly. One, perhaps the leader, stands twice larger than the others and wears two feathers on his head. Mm -hmm. I count 35 sheep with a hunting spirit among them, his headdress horns bigger than any rams, his shoulders like wings connected to a small torso. Mm -hmm. How patient the artist must have been chipping away figures alive on this rock. Wind skirts the petroglyph, preserving the great hunt a whoosh in Austin tops, then it's gone, leaving deep silence behind. Mm. Thank you for inviting me to read tonight. Thank you so much too, Patty, for being here and reading and sharing your choices of Bill Stafford's poems. There are so many uh, to choose from and your poem, The Great Hunt. So also thanks for uh, everything that you've done for the friends of William Stafford for all of that time and being the first president of the Friends. Mm -hmm. And finally, for all of the, uh, the hosting and work you, you and Vince have done in Ashland for visiting poets, readings, workshops, et cetera. So quite a contribution to the community. Thank you. So our next poet, our last featured reader tonight, here I am. Hi, Vince. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> it's Vince Wixon. And his most recent book of poetry is Laying By, published by Flowstone Press in 2017. In the late 80s and early 90s, he co-produced videos on William Stafford, collected on one DVD, William Stafford, Life and Poems. After William Stafford's death, Vince and Patty Wixon helped set up the Stafford archives. Vince helped make the first cut of poems for the Staffords The Way It Is, selected in new poems. The Paul Merchant, he edited three other Stafford books, including Sound of the Axe, a collection of Stafford aphorisms and mm -hmm. acrostic poems. On the Stafford archives website, 
you can read Vince and Paul Merchant's article, William Stafford and his first publisher, The Making of West of Your City and Traveling Through the Dark. Would you join me in welcoming our fourth poet, fourth featured reader tonight, Vince Wixon. Vince. Thank you. As Tom mentioned, uh, the way it is, New and Selected Poems published 1998, five years after Bill Stafford's death is the main selected Stafford. And the process of choosing them began with Paul Merchant, who was the director of the archives at the time, Patty over here on my right and out of the picture. Uh, and I gathered and read about 2,500 poems and selected 500 to present to the main editor, Kim Stafford. Eventually about 400 poems were fitted into the size of the book that Gray Wolf Press wanted to publish. Since then, I've kept a list of poems I wish there'd been room for in the way it is, and I want to read four of them. One poem at the top of my list and, and Paul Merchant's list too is Spring Interest, which was written during Stafford's month at Yaddo in 1956, the same month he wrote Traveling Through the Dark. Spring Interest was published in the New Yorker in 1958 and never collected into a book. Spring Interest. Today or maybe yesterday, the minnows returned. There by the inlet they hang, examining the current in and out of shadows and shafts and hollows. When a beaver crossed the pool carrying lilies, the dead water rolled heavy splashes in the forest. Now the pool is changed. The dark is alive. But the melted snow formed in these brown hollows and the beaver worried through with his serious tail is irradiated by those little doubts. Now that there are splinters flashing in the dark, I believe in more. I join in what I see. Little quick things are always an opening. Minnows flaws in silver the accomplished lake and save the day from wisdoms and mountains. Spring interest uh, not being collected into a book by Stafford himself is odd since he was an astute judge of his own work. As for it not appearing in the way it is, I think we perhaps we never ran across it when we were looking for poems. In 1990, when making a second Stafford video with colleague Mike Marquis, we asked Bill Stafford to go back through some of his recent daily writings and talk about some of the drafts. And this is one of them, when it comes. Anytime, now, the next minute, years from today, you lean forward and wait. You relax, but you don't forget. Someone plans an elaborate party with a banquet dancing, even fireworks when feasting is over. You look at them. All those years when you searched the world like a ferret, these never happened. Your marriage, your family, prayers, curses, only dreams. A vacuum has opened everywhere. Cities, armies, those chairs ranked in, great, in the great hall for the audience. There isn't anyone. Like a shutter, the sky opens and closes and the show is over. The next act will deny that anything ever happened. Your hand falls open, it is empty. It never held a knife, a flower, gold or love or now. Lean closer, listen to me, there isn't any hand. After reading that poem, Stafford told us, and I'm quoting, <clears throat> just the way it came out, I still have a kind of interest and I like to be fervent. Listen to me, there isn't any hand. It's as if all those things that are accumulating in an ordinary way suddenly add up to something I have to say. And he added, the poems that stay interesting to me are ones I haven't conquered. I even have a phrase for this, Wood that can learn is no good for a bow. They've got something in, in them that wasn't predicted. I just feel better about them. <clears throat> Butterflies in the radiator grill. Arrayed like Solomon, 
the radiator grill snores itself, blue, brown, yellow, gray, all the colors that the flowers of the field in their innocence, their carelessness betray. Lives we pass, a screen takes us. There are lines we cross like warnings on our way. So cruel that summer sings out, storms. We all travel toward one big storm someday. Paul Merchant and I included this poem, Butterflies in the Radiator Grill, in Sound of the Axe. As Tom said, it's a collection of Stafford aphorisms and aphoristic poems. And the aphorism would be storms. We all travel toward one big storm someday. My last uh, Stafford poem, uh, Bill and Dorothy Stafford loved dogs. They lived with several of them. And Bill wrote a number of poems about dogs. The best known one, Choosing a Dog, is in the way it is. And this is another, which was uh, first published in Poetry Magazine in 1986, called Coming Back. Near your face, a breath, your dog, its day. Into those dark eyes, receiver wells, responsible for all there is, you fall and come back new. Brushed by such deep love, the world fades. The world fades and brushed by such deep love comes back new. You fall responsible for all there is. Those dark eyes, receiver wells near your face, a breath, your dog, its day. And if you're interested in reading more uncollected poems, which would likely be new to you, uh, as was mentioned, the Friends of uh, Stafford Newsletter, you can subscribe to and they each issue, uh, Tim Barnes publishes some uncollected poems. And of course, as uh, has already been said, the Friends site is williamstafford.org. I'll finish uh, with my poem, which is another dog poem, very recent. I grew up in a, on a farm in Minnesota where we had at least two dogs. And this poem has an epigraph, two lines from a poem by Robert Bly, William Stafford's friend who died last year. Border Collie, the epigraph. You know how dogs turn up at a farm and they wag but can't explain, Robert Bly. They turn up because a displeased and lazy owners dumped them in the country, but not too far out. So they came to the farm closest to town, yours, a place always with at least two dogs, as the saying goes about poor farmers. Shy, skittish, they walk slowly up the lane, tail tips moving tentatively, not allowing a touch. Those that have been beaten view every man with suspicion. A child or woman may approach, may offer a pat on the head, a stroke along the spine. Those you see that have prospects might look like a herding dog, a border collie maybe, who couldn't put up with being fenced in a yard or tied to a clothesline pole, the kind of dog with a purpose he must fulfill or turn neurotic. Beautiful with his black and white markings, chest near the ground, tail curved up, sharp eyes on you, looking to be sent on a mission. He can't explain his past, but it doesn't matter. From experience, you know it already. After accepting you, before long, this dog knows where the cows spend their days, when they should come home from the far end of the pasture to be milked, and goes out and herds them to the barn. No need for Sheppy get the cows. For those dogs, when they come down your lane, you simply leave food in the yard until they understand they're employed. Thank you. Vince, thank you so much too. Welcome. For, yeah, for sharing the uncollected poems of uh, Bill Stafford. And thank you, Vince. That was, I love that last line. Yeah. Just really drove it home to me and made me burst out and, and smile. Um, Harvest Moody said, that's the best dog in the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, before I read my Stafford poem, I just want to mention that the uh, president, fearless leader of the Friends of William Stafford, 
and his trusty assistant and co-chair probably and treasurer and secretary and I don't know how many hats they both are wearing now but just phenomenal poets and humans Dennis and Helen Schmidling are with us this evening and I'm hoping we may hear from one or both of them uh, in the reading portion of the evening but hi and thank you um, thank you for being here <clears throat> I changed my mind about what poem to read several times. It's hard to have just one. But I finally several times came back to Malheur before dawn because <laughs> I needed to feel how it makes me feel. An owl sound <clears throat> wandered along the road with me. I didn't hear it. I breathed it into my ears. Little ones at first, the stars retired, leaving polished little circles on the sky for a while. Then the sun began to shout from below the horizon. Throngs of birds campaigned their music a tent of sound. From across a pond out of the mist, one drake made a V and said its name. Some vast animal of air began to rouse from the reeds and lean outward. Frogs discovered their national anthem again. I didn't know a ditch could hold so much joy. <laughs> so magic at time it was that I was both brave and afraid. Some day like this might save the world. It, it makes me want to cry. It makes me so, it makes me so happy. You know, it's like, um, oh, to believe again that someday like this might change the world. And I know in my heart I do. Um, because I read poetry. <laughs> anyway. Um, <clears throat> The next thing I want to do before I start our readings is uh, diverge for a minute. And I hope this isn't news to anyone here. I hope you know this already. Um, but uh, on the night that connects December 17th and December 18th of 2021, my teacher and mentor and colleague and dear friend, Shelley Reese died. And um, Shelley was a marvelous man who did m so much for the friends of William Stafford, was at its helm for several years. Uh, he, his, his was truly a poetic soul. Um, it was great, even as he fought more than one disease um, that was significant, he uh, still could carry on a completely coherent conversation about literature and poetry and loved to hear poetry and read poetry and write poetry. And I, I want to tell you that, and I don't know the name of his volume because I've spaced it out, but he has a book that will be coming out, a collection of his poems um, from Finishing Line Press at some time in the not too distant future. I really wish they could have moved a little faster, but oh well. And um, <clears throat> he, uh, he knew it was time, um, the decision to discontinue um, life continuing efforts was a decision he and his wife both made and I was fortunate to get to talk to him before he went, but I was in San Diego. And uh, I don't know, he, was, he changed my life. And I know he changed many lives of students and friends and colleagues and poets and friends of the William Stafford folks and just anybody he ran into. So I want to read one of his poems. Um, and I was gonna read, um, <clears throat> Um, uh, 
there's one that he, he wrote a, a poem gardener about his beloved wife mary because she was a gardener but i just and it's beautiful but i have to read the one that i always loved the most <laughs> and it's called night crawlers they love sex in the spring grass. Just a year after the 51 flood, the yards were full of them every night. Hermaphrodite lovers locked together, almost invisible in the silt, shining back at my amber filtered flashlight beam. A bait station boy, I'd hold down pair after pair till they both relaxed, came loose from their grip underground and I could drop them into a can. I picked up gallons that way, transferring them to new dirt in the back of the car. We came 40 miles in just to pick them up and sell them for bait. I marveled at the number that stayed coupled tight as I dropped them into the can with the others, their translucent blue shining. On my knees in strangers' yards by night, I learned the way desire, like water, rises from the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to Shelley. Thank you so much, Sue. Anyway, um, now uh, we're going to move into the reading of the, you know, where, where you guys get to read. I hope everybody will. And we have uh, decided that at first round, everyone can read one poem. And then if we have time, people can read another poem. And we ask that you do not read, ask me, because we're saving that as a special poem. And Aaron will read it at the close of our event. And so, you know, just so I, we don't want anybody to ruin the big finish by giving it away. <laughs> Anyway, um, so Alicia, do I turn this over to you now? Well, we can, what we can do is we don't see anybody in the chat. So probably what we could do is have people raise their hands and we'll just do it that way. Okay. Okay. And so if you raise your hands, Linda, Linda, <laughs> and, and why don't you, why don't you introduce yourself just a little bit? Okay. And, and then the poem you want to read. Okay, dog. Um, I'm Linda Leppard, and I've been a resident of Lake Oswego for about 21 years now. I used to be your vice chair <laughs> of the library board, and I have been to many of these in person, and I'm so delighted to be here online, no matter what we face out there, but I do miss the cake, okay? I miss <laughs> the birthday cake. <laughs> so, now this was a tough one because... I, I, I read one year and everybody went, oh my gosh, I forgot about that poem. But I think I'm gonna choose a different one because it, it says so much about us. And so I've got to pull it up here because I don't have paper right now, so it's online. And it's called, You Reading This, Be Ready. Mm -hmm. Starting here, what do you want to remember? <clears throat> How sunlight creeps along a shining floor, what scent of old wood hovers, what softened sound from outside fills the air. Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found Carry into evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now, starting here, right in this room, when you turn around? Great. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Who would like to read next? And let's go over to the other page. Let's see if there's um, Eric. Eric. Hello, I'm I'm Eric Stone. Patty Mitz is youngest, uh, coming in from Iowa City, Iowa, and uh, all of the traveling through the dark stuff that Vince and Patty talked about. I was a uh, uh, 12, 13, 14 year old, uh, and had the fortune of uh, going to Lewis and Clark College, so was able to uh, 
be at uh, William and Dorothy's house several times in Lake Oswego. And it just was a real treat, honor of mine. And uh, when I went to graduate school in oh, at Ohio University in Athens, uh, I was delighted to see William Stafford was doing a reading. And so I uh, went to the reading and after walked up and introduced or reintroduced myself. And uh, I spoke briefly about a poem and he said a few comments about it and after the reading and then folded it, uh, took it out of his pocket and handed it to me. So I still have the folded original reading oh. from that wow. event in wow. 1992. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, a, I'm a professor at the University of Iowa and a, a scene designer in theater uh, through my career. And, uh, and so it is short, but <clears throat> you'll understand. First grade. In the play, Amy didn't want to be anybody, so she managed the curtain. Sharon wanted to be Amy, but Sam wouldn't let anybody be anybody else. He said it was wrong. All right, Steve said, I'll be me, but I don't like it. So Amy was Amy, and we didn't have the play, and Sharon cried. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much for the wonderful evening. Yeah, that's a great story. Marvelous. That's who's next? Yeah. Come on. Jennifer. Jennifer, Jennifer Platt Walter. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pratt Walter, and I'm coming in from Vancouver. And I just found out about this event purely by accident, so I'm really glad to be here. So the poem I was thinking of was the one with so much joy in a ditch, but Susan read that <laughs> so well, I don't begrudge that. <laughs> so this is called Even in the Desert. Um, and it's History is Loose Again, I think is the collection. You know how Willow is. Well, there was this girl that evolution stopped at. The way a tree accepts the wind when it roves the country, this girl would bend. When the wind found her one day, she followed where it went, like a snowflake in love, ravishing. You know that lake over by China Peak? When last seen, the two of them, girl and wind, and one more, death, were dancing toward the waves. The way wind is, and how it moves, and the long promises, the centuries of trust, had easily captured evolution's girl. Her soul still sleeps in this beautiful dust. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Jennifer. My pleasure. We've got some greetings from Anchorage, Alaska. Influenced by Stafford's two essay collections at a significant time prior to MFA school. That's from Sandy Clevin to everybody from Anchorage, Alaska. So thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. And I know my wife Jane wants to read a poem. So would you like to go next? Okay. Well, I'm reading from the book, The Sound of the Axe, and I read in another reading and <laughs> chosen a poem by William Stafford. And what I did was I just opened the book and there was the poem. So that's what I did with this one, um, Buddhist Thoughts. And I'm going to give you not the whole experience of them, but the first part of his thoughts. In a mountain, there is one big stone a crack is considering. We are saved by that hesitation. All trees lean in the spring, but soon toughen for winter, willing to say the great name. In this world, what I really like are things that don't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nice choice. Yeah. Nice, nice book, too. Yes, yes. 
Who would like to be next? Um, I see that we have uh, Barbara Smoody who would like to read. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hello, Barbara. Hi. Hello. So we saw this poem by accident in the Metal River Valley. We were on a long trip. It was a hot August day. And we went to have a good look at the view and there was a poem, yep. a valley like this. Sometimes you look at an empty valley like this and suddenly the air is filled with snow. That is the way the whole world happened. There was nothing. And then, and maybe sometime you will look out and even the mountains are gone. The world become nothing again. What can a person do to help bring back the world? We have to watch it, then look at each other. Together, we hold it close and carefully. Save it like a bubble that can disappear if we don't watch out. Please think about this as you go on. Breathe on the world. Hold out your hands to it. When mornings and evenings roll along, watch how they open and close, how they invite you to the long party that your life is. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, thanks, Bill. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Very nice. <clears throat> Let's check on the other page. Who would like to read a poem next? Anyone? I'm doing what I do in class. I'm looking into people's faces, hoping they can see me and know them. Wow. Helen, you saw oh. I was staring at you. Uh, uh, Helen. Helen Fridley. <laughs> You'll need to mute, unmute yourself. Unmute. I'd like to read it. Dennis has the controls. I did it. You did it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'd like to read it. I, I can't tell if I'm in the picture here or not. He's really I can see you. Yeah, you yeah, are. Okay. This is crazy setup that we've got here. Um, I love the poems that everybody's chosen, but for some reason, my mind gravitated to, a, for the unknown enemy, probably because the, there's so much dissent and unhappiness and, and we're so fractured in our world today. And I don't think Bill would have liked that. That's for sure. But this kind of brings it all back home and ties it up, at least does for me, for the unknown enemy. This monument is for the unknown good in our enemies. Like a picture, their life began to appear. They gathered at home in the evening and sang. Above their fields, they saw a new sky. A holiday came and they carried the baby to the park for a party. Sunlight surrounded them. Here we glimpse what our minds long turned away from. The great mutual blindness darkened that sunlight in the park and the sky that was new in the holidays. This monument says that one afternoon we stood here letting a part of our minds escape. They came back but different enemy. One day we glimpsed your life. This monument is for you. And wow. that I'm gonna remind people is available uh, as one of the broadsides that can be purchased from the website. But that just hit me to know. Thank you. I, Thank I, you, Helen. I felt to make sure that Dennis, are you going to read? You know, I have a question for Barbara. When you uh, read that, when you saw that, when you came across that poem, a valley like this. Yeah. Did you look over the edge? Oh, <laughs> yes, of course I looked over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way down. <laughs> uh, everyone will forgive me for a short story here. Helen and I were at that location. Uh, when a Japanese delegation arrived, at first it was just one man. And he looked around and looked around and looked around. He finally found that, that uh, 
home. And then he disappeared. And we were there trying to get some photographs. And here he comes back with 20 or 30 people. And they all gathered. And he walked over to the to the poem. And he put his back to the poem. And he recited it to them. Oh, wow. In English. Wow. And then in Japanese. Wow. And again, wow. Japanese. And then everybody cried. <laughs> And wow. they had actually come to that location. It was part of their tour. They went out of their way from Seattle to see this place where poems were placed. And we had the privilege to watch that whole experience. And they all looked over the edge. <laughs> wow. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Amazing. Um, since that time, the um, Overlook has been upgraded and uh, Silver Star, the poem Silver Star, has been located in the next level yeah. up from a valley like this. Same place. Same it place, looks, looks just the direction. next um, little hike up. Yeah. Nice, nice. Thank you. David, were you going to speak? David, did you want to yeah. read? Yeah, this is uh, this is David Mon. I'm Patty Wixon's brother. Lives in Spokane. I mean, he lives in Seattle with um, my wife Kathleen. And uh, this being uh, William Stafford's birthday, I thought I would read a William Stafford poem again to, that has a very uplifting feel to it. That might end this well. Um, and I will read, I actually have it framed along with my sister's poem underneath it after Bill Stafford. I'm hoping that Patty can read this after I read this and make an effort to do so uh, well. <laughs> Let's see if that happens. <laughs> Hummingbirds, too small to feel fear. One arrives faster than sight and then hangs more jeweled than bird. As a flower, wings worshiping speed, a blur in the air. Once picking up, once stunned by the glass, I felt that little motor in my hand, a religion that I know, that I now knew all the way up my arm, abrupt as the universe was when there was nothing and God said, go. Sometimes like that you meet what is real, touched alive, a visit nobody arranged. A day comes, tame you thought, and you dream long just being you doing a kind act. Suddenly you have a hummingbird in your hand. It's William Stafford. Patty, would you be willing to read here? after William Stafford? No, not, not this time, David, not another time. <laughs> next year, she says she'll okay. read it next year. <laughs> next year, all right, okay. You know what, was, I, I, this, I, go ahead, sorry. Well, I'm just saying that what I learned at 66 is the name of the poem, but next year it'll be more like what I learned at 86. <laughs> is that Pat? Okay? I think I think it would be wonderful if we heard from our state poet laureate emerita Paul Ann Peterson. How can we not hear from our poet laureate emerita? We'd like to invite her if we could. If I could have a little license, if she has a poem, we'd love to hear from her. Emmett. <laughs> well, I did have a poem in mind, but someone else read it. That's kind of how it goes with Phil Stafford things. You sort of have something lined up in your mind and it's lined up in someone else's mind too. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for well, asking. Yeah. Thank, thanks to both of you and thanks to David. Thank you for reading that poem. So we have, we have a poem for next year. 
<laughs> is there anyone else that would like to read a poem? Who has not read a poem? Yeah, I guess I will. Yeah. Um, for me, this is a sign of the times too. Um, it, it is just uh, something I cling to and think about and pray over often how people can catch on to what is real, what is, what is core to our experience in this life together. This is Bill's poem, The Way It Is. There's a thread you follow. It goes among the things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you're pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. I would like to, we have a broad side of that. And uh, we asked um, that that broadside be prepared at a time when the person who did those broadsides for us was dying. Mm -hmm. And his son finished this piece. And I, I spent many, many conversations with him during that time. And it was really these words that pulled him through uh, that helped him through that grieving process. It's a beautiful broadside. I hope you all get a chance to see it sometime. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dennis. You're welcome. Thank you for reading the poem and telling us about the broadside. We might be getting to the point where we're ready to end. Is there anybody that hasn't read a poem or would like to read a poem? Aaron, would you like to? Are we ready to? <laughs> We're ready to end with there and reading Ask Me. I will tell you a tiny, tiny story about this poem. I taught high school in Cordova, Alaska, which is a town off the road system uh, in Prince William Sound. And uh, when I started, my students hated poetry. I mean, with the white hot heat of a thousand suns, which is a hard thing for a poet to uh, to handle. And uh, one day, uh, one of the young men uh, had a temper tantrum in my room just about. And I stood up and read this poem, which I kept in the inside of a notebook on my desk. So Bill comes through again and helps us find that thread. Ask me. Sometime when the river is ice, ask me mistakes I have made. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. Others have come in their slow way into my thought, and some have tried to help or to hurt. Ask me what difference their strongest love or hate has made. I will listen to what you say. You and I can turn and look at the silent river and wait. We know the current is there, hidden. And there are comings and goings from miles away that hold the stillness exactly before us. What the river says, that is what I say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Tom, I could share a story that I won't tell perfectly well, but it's a wonderful story. I just never told it before. Okay. Um, we have a poet in Alaska, Emily Wall. When she was younger, she arrived at the campus for a visit where William was teaching um, down there in Oregon. And he gave her time and they had a really wonderful conversation and she was touched and the day ended and she went on with her life. A long time later, randomly in a poetry collection, 
uh, she sees a poem titled Emily and she reads it and she recognizes he is giving an account of what had happened that day with her. Huh. What a lovely story. Wow. Yeah. We, um, yeah, we, she's written that she put it into an essay, uh, I think partly at our request, and we published it in Cirque Journal in the last issue, which is readable online at Cirque Journal. Okay. So there's a longer story, but. Uh, okay. But thanks so much. Do you want to put the journal in the chat? Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Hi. Well, Tom, Tom no. could I read one more? Hi. Of course. Okay. This, this, you know, we, it, well, of course, I just shut it down. <laughs> Hold on, I'll get it back. Hold on, there it is. Um, this is. This is one that people say they forget a lot. And so if I can get the dead gum, okay, Google, quit it. There we go. It's called, and this kind of leaves it in an upbeat place. And it's called Why I Am Happy. Now has come an easy time. I let it roll. There is a lake somewhere so blue and far nobody owns it. A wind comes by and a willow listens gracefully. I hear all this every summer. I laugh and cry for every turn of the world. It's terribly cold, innocent spin. That lake stays blue and free. It goes on and on. And I know where it is. Uh -huh. yeah. I like that. Yeah. I it's, like that one too. That's one of my favorites, Tom. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah, yes, but I, I know where it is. Yeah. And I know where it is. <laughs> yeah. hey. Well, before, hey. we, before we end, hey. who, who you got there, Sue? Who? Um, this is my grandson, Wiley, Aww. and he's waving and saying hi. I'm at it on mute, but he, he couldn't figure out, I think, why nobody except Alicia was waving back at him for a while. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> what a cutie. What a cutie. <laughs> Thank can we, you. Can we acknowledge and uh, the featured readers again? Yeah. Aaron. Thank you all. Aaron, <laughs> Emmett, Vince, Patty. Thank you all. And thank you everybody for being here. It's great fun to do this with you, Sue. Yeah. Thank you, Tom and Susan, yeah. again for it's putting this together. To Amazing. And thank you, Alicia. Yeah. Always. We're yeah. happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Alicia, uh, for making this possible and hosting this. Hi. 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 Who are we on? Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Okay. What a what a rich evening. Really, I thank feel you. great now. Yeah. There's yeah. Bill. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.